Hello and welcome to today's Hose Basics Tech Talk presented by Swagelock Central Ontario and Atlantic Canada. One of more than 200 authorized Swagelock sales and service centers located around the world in 70 different countries. I'm Tim Phillips, Marketing Manager, and leading today's Tech Talk is Swagelock Certified Trainer and Hose Advisor, Corey Schoenmakers. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Please use the live event Q&A feature for all questions. Questions will be answered periodically throughout the session. If you have further questions after the completion of today's Tech Talk, please direct them to Corey Schoenmakers, whose email is on the screen, or the technical support team at your local Swagelock Sales and Service Center. We understand through extensive global research and first-hand experience that businesses are under pressure to do more with less. To maximize system performance while juggling smaller budgets, skilled labor gaps, and changing safety requirements. The COVID-19 pandemic only adds to these pressures. Swagelock and its sales and service centers like Swagelock Central Ontario, Atlantic Canada are here to lend a helping hand to provide you with the right resources at the right time. Swagelock Central Ontario, Atlantic Canada has three locations, Mississauga, Ontario, Ottawa, Ontario, and St. John, New Brunswick. And we provide local engineering and technical support across Central, Eastern, and Northern Ontario, as well as all of Atlantic Canada. We are one part of an extensive global network of Swagelock sales and service centers that are here to help you with your applications and share knowledge through our extensive training and system evaluation offering, much of which we are adapting to provide virtually to you. Whether you need help with an application or to improve your knowledge in a specific area, whatever your pressure, think of us as your solutions provider. Now I'd like to pass it over to Corey Schoenmakers to lead the Hose Basics Tech Talk. Corey, take it away. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, everybody. My name is Corey Schoenmakers. Uh, I'm uh, one of the Swagelock Hose Advisors with Swagelock Central Ontario and Swagelock Atlantic Canada. I've been with Swagelock now just over 16 years. Um, so one of the things that I do is we go on site we go on to people's uh, plants, we take a look and we do what's called the hose advisory service. So we, I'm one of the ones that do that as well. Also, we go on site, we can do steam trap testing. Uh, one of the other things that we do is compressed air testing. And one of the other things we look at is helping people select their regulators. So today we're gonna do the hose technical session. So we're gonna talk a little bit in the hose introduction. We're gonna do some construction and selection, and then we're gonna get into some best practices as well. Also on the call, we have Phil Reed. He's our training and technical support manager. He's been with the company over 33 years, and he's gonna be answering the questions on the side. So combined, we've got over 49 years experience on here with Swagelock, pretty cool. So again, today we're gonna to get into the introduction. We're gonna do a little bit of hose life considerations. We're gonna talk about construction and selection. With that, we're gonna get into talking about the core tubes, reinforcement layers, covers and tags, and connections. And then we're gonna get into some best practices, proper installation inspection techniques, and then some hose inspections. So why does selecting the right hose matter? We always get asked this all the time. What is a hose? Well, you can imagine a hose is basically you have a core tube and then you put a braid package over top of it of some sort to give it so you have higher pressure ranges and then you add end connections. So where are hoses used? Well, in your house, on the back of your toilet, you might have a hose or you should have one. Uh, under your sink, you may have a hose. You may have a hose for your garden hose. You have an automobile, you definitely have a hose in that. Then we have industrial hoses. So one of the things we ask is not all hoses are made for the exact application. So you got to keep that in mind when you're selecting a hose that you got to keep in mind what you're going to be using it for. Okay, why should we use hoses? Flexibility, routing, Maybe you have a portable piece of equipment that you move in and you just use temporarily. So you, a hose is going to be something good. 
do we have vibration in the system? Do you have the ability to fabricate the hose? And then we have some storage capabilities. So why should we not use a hose? Sometimes running a piece of tubing might be more cost effective. So again, is it cost effective for you to run a hose? You might have some routing, so for their installation concerns. Permeation, we're gonna talk a little bit more about all these as well as we get in. Maintenance, maybe adding a hose into the system is actually gonna create more maintenance for you. So again, things like that to keep in consideration. Maybe the way you've routed the hose, you could have media get entrapped in the hose as well. And then what's the life expectancy of the hose? So how long will a hose last? Well, it depends. I like to use the, uh, the tire analogy. So tires on a car are a wear item. So depending on how you drive your car is going to determine how long you're going to have your tires last. Are you speeding and stopping all the time? Are you spinning out your tires? Again, how you drive your car. Are you going off road with it? So again, hose is a wear item. So I like to tie the two together. Phil, do we have any uh, host questions for the introduction? Uh, no questions at this point, Corey. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to get into talking about the construction. We're going to talk about the core tubes. We're going to get into the reinforcement layers, covers and tags, and end connections. So construction. Typically a hose will be considered with these four components. So you're gonna have a core tube, you're gonna have your reinforcement braid, you're gonna have your cover, and you're gonna have your end connections. Keep in mind that your reinforcement braid could be your cover. We're gonna talk about the core tube. We're gonna talk about the wetted surfaces, the media contact, and the core tube's typically not designed for pressure. So when we get into talking about some of the core tubes, they're smooth bore. So these have more precise flow, uh, easier to clean, and they're easier to drain. Um, in the larger sizes, they tend to be less flexible uh, and more susceptible to kinking. Um, if you're looking at the straws there in the middle here, wondering why we have those, that's kind of demonstrating the convoluted bore. Um, everyone's had a straw where it bends and flexes. So in the larger sizes, it actually makes it a little bit more flexible. Uh, some of the pitfalls of the ballroom, though, is sometimes you get trap fluids inside there and it may affect some flow. Okay, we're going to talk about the metal, we're going to talk about the fluoropolymer cores, we're going to talk about some thermoplastic and rubber cores as well. Okay, and the metal, these are more general needs. Where we see a lot of customers using uh, all metal hoses is areas where they don't want the gas to get out into the atmosphere uh, maybe higher pressures as well. So for an example, say you have a cylinder shed and you've got 2,700 PSI nitrogen and you want to run that over to your regulator, a lot of times you'll see where that gets used. Again, more higher temperatures as well, you'll see up to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, again, lower permeation levels, and I'll get more into that as we go. Uh, large range of sizes, so from quarter inch to two inch. Uh, and in some of the models in the all metal, we do offer a three inch model as well. And these are typically with a convoluted construction. Okay, so typically what they do when you're making a core, metal core is you're gonna take a, a high quality stainless steel strip, you're gonna roll it and then put a weld onto it, and then it's gonna be corrugated. One of the different uh, ways of forming these, there's hydroforming, crimp forming and mechanical forming. Some of the advantages of using hydroforming and crimp forming, again, you minimize the stress risers that cause work hardening and premature failure, last longer in dynamic or a pressure application. Some of the disadvantages, it's a lot more expensive. Uh, the crimp is a little bit more uh, economical than uh, hydroforming. Uh, mm -hmm. Mechanical, these are typically less expensive and you can uh, make them faster. Again, when you're doing that, what can happen though is you can be, uh, cause the metal to be thin and you could even put some stress risers on it and you could have premature failure. Again, with the mechanical forming, you'll see here, this is where the weld is, and you'll see that along this line right here, this actually causes the, the hose to deform, to deform and causes a stress riser in that hose right away. And over here, you can see when we are rolling it, 
that you could even cause it to uh, have premature failure. Some of the fluoropolymer types, these are typically more chemically inert styles. You hear of a Teflon lined hose or a PFA lined hose. Again, you have a good pressure range, minus 65 Fahrenheit to 450 Fahrenheit. Um, but what can happen is they're more permeable. So we got to keep that in mind when we're selecting that. And again, I keep mentioning, but we'll get back into the permeation a little bit more into the presentation. Again, we have some carbon black options. So if you do have a, a media that may cause uh, a static, um, you may want to consider the carbon black option. Uh, and again, they're a lot more cleanable. Neuroplastic hoses, typically higher pressures, uh, up to 5,000. Sometimes you can get up to 10,000 PSI in hydraulic applications. Again, minus 40 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature range, more general industry applications. Rubber hoses, example of these is more water, air applications. Again, lower pressures. Uh, again, you're minus 40 Fahrenheit to 200 Fahrenheit. Good, good size range, you typically from quarter inch to one inch in this line that we have. Um, again, more resistant, to uh, more resistant to damage from crushing or kinking. Uh, and the reinforcement layers are typically a wire or fiber braids. This hose is really interesting. This hose here, you combine a Teflon core so you get the chemically inert uh, application, um, but then we get the metal bellows over top because we know that the Teflon line will permeate and it'll allow the gas to get out through uh, the core, but this allows you to have it encapsulated and capture it so if you're running a low pressure gas that you do not want to get out into the atmosphere, this type of hose might be something to consider. Static dissipation. Basically, if you can imagine, if you have a line or a hose and you, you use a standard Teflon core, it's not carbon black, um, it's, that means the hose is not grounded. So basically you could have the say steam or um, say a polymer going through that at a high velocity that may create a static. Um, that could cause basically the path of least resistance, the spark will actually go right through the side of the hose. Okay, um, and that would cause your maybe a leak or a failure. So again, we, we want it to be conductive. Uh, you'll see here, um, this, the carbon black, it comes in the uh, convoluted, but also in the smooth bore. Uh, one of the things that we always get asked, will that carbon black leach into our product? No, it won't leach into your product. So it's very good that way. Very used quite a bit in steam applications because steam at a high velocity through the hose can create a, a lot of static buildup. You'll see this is a silicone uh, cover and this is what it may look like if you have this on the outside. Again, that's a hose there where the static uh, didn't have, wasn't granted, didn't use a carbon black core right up the side of the hose. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about permeation. I've mentioned it a few times. A good analogy with permeation from a hose is everyone here has probably been to a, a birthday party or whatever, and you see those helium balloons. And then after everyone leaves a few days later, you see that the balloon has actually fallen now. It's not, it's not, sticking up in you know near the ceiling that's because the helium is is actually leaking out through the balloon material so that's a good analogy of permeating again you can have uh, stuff permeate into the hose as well as permeate out of the hose so some gases are more uh, are going to permeate faster than others so helium would be one of the higher ones, helium and hydrogen are very uh, small molecules and will permeate more. You'll see here, then we've got argon as the next, and then you've got nitrogen and air. So just to keep that in mind, when you're selecting your hose, um, you're gonna, it'll make a difference on what core you're gonna be using, depending on whether you can have permeation in your environment or not. What we're looking at here is talking about non-sintered, slow-sintered, and post-sintered. So some hoses are what they call non-sintered, which means there's no curing process for the hose. It's strictly the core tubes just extruded. They add in their braid package and their end connections and away you go. What we're looking at here is slow sintered and then you've got post sintered. So you'll see the orange line right here. Again, these two are a lot less uh, permeation rates. 
What slow sintered means is basically as the cork tube is extruded, actually we've, they're actually adding heat to the process so that the, uh, the elements of the Teflon or PFA will bond tightly together. Uh, and then post sintered is what we have, um, and it's your least amount of permeation through the hose. And what that is, is imagine they extrude the hose, then they put the core tube in an oven and then they bake it at a high rate. So a good analogy is making pizzas on a conveyor or uh, you know baking a cake in an oven. Now what we have here, this is a, a hose core that's been um, non-sintered and we've put it underwater and then we've put helium through it and you can see the little bubbles forming on the outside. So that would happen if you're using a non-centered hose. So a lot of permeation. Okay, now we're gonna get into the reinforcement layers. So on some of the hoses that we sell, we actually bond a fiberglass to the outside of the PFA or the Teflon core. And so what that does is imagine if you're taking a piece of uh, standard Teflon tubing and you go to bend it, well, at a, a certain point of that bend radius, you're gonna actually start to flatten out. But by bonding that fiberglass to the outside of that core, what we do is we give it a lot more hoop strength. Therefore, we make the hose more flexible. Then we add the uh, stainless steel braid package to the outside as well uh, to give it the pressure rating. And then we could add a cover like this, the silicone here just for more, you don't have to any wear items or if you need to have a cleaning or the ability to clean it. And here you'll see we've got a core package and then the braids are getting wet, uh, woven uh, on top of the core. Okay, there's some reinforcement layers that you can get as well. Uh, this particular hose, they've got the core right here. And then they've taken uh, in the similar slide that you saw how they put the small wires around it. And then they've actually poured their material onto that there. So again, a different style of hose. Okay, and I mentioned earlier, the actual braid package that you see here can actually be the cover as well. A lot of hoses, people just like the look of the stainless steel. They don't need a cover on top of it to add any extra cost. Okay, so we can add a cover as well. So uh, one of the cool things with adding a cover, uh, one, you can actually start to print information on the hose as well. So for example here, you know, we can say the manufacturer, we can talk about the standard of the hose. We can put the size of the hose on there. We can put the working pressure, and then we can even put the date of manufacturing on there. Now, another way that we can do this is we can actually add tags, okay? So we've got, up, you'll see up here, a matte tag. It's a nice blue tag. You can change the colors as well if you do want to, but you can add up to five line items on these tags, okay? We've also got another one here, a lanyard tag. And then if you had a silicone hose, you look over here on the right, you'll actually see what we call a permatag. So this gets permanently put onto the hose. Um, one of the cool things is say you're buying uh, and you could put a PO number on there, so a purchase order number, you could add all kinds of different information. Maybe you wanna put what uh, um, equipment is for. So again, you can have a lot of different information on there. You could even have the hose part number if you needed to. And again, we have some clamp tags as well. You can add on there is a CRN, so a Canadian registration number. So if you are um, working with the TSSA here in Ontario and you're building anything to B311 or B313, you may your product may need to have a CRN number. So you can add that to the hose as well. We'll see here we've actually added the perma tags. So again, they've got three different tags on this hose, so they can have different information. Again, right over here, you'll see there's another tag as well. Again, it could even be saying what end connection goes to what side. Some of the protective covers, you'll see here we have an armor guard. This actually um, helps the hose. So say you're, um, we see it a lot used on truck filling stations, things like that, where somebody might be dragging the hose across the, um, the parking lot. Uh, this protects the hose one, but also if the guy on the truck is pulling it, then it allows it so it doesn't bend past its bend radius. Uh, we also have some fire jackets here. Uh, I've seen these used a lot, uh, even for protecting people from getting burned. So say like a steam system, they may add a fire jacket so that the person, if they do bump into the hose, they don't actually get burned. 
And then we have, you'll see over here, we have some abrasion protection again. So if it, say they're dragging the hose, that you don't get any uh, wear or tear on the braid package. Spring guards. Uh, my example of this I'd like to use with people is if you're ever at a gas station, you look up top, there's typically a spring guard on the hose. It's there to protect the end connection so that it doesn't kink uh, and or cause premature wear in the hose. You can also get these the full length of the hose as well. Again, that would end up acting like a, a guard for the hose as well. But again, very good to protect the end connections here uh, so that you don't have any uh, kinking or wearing. Um, newer in our uh, offerings is insulation. We've kind of offered some form of insulation, but now we're actually offering a higher temp up to 250 as well. Um, but again, you'll see here, you've actually got your insulation layer, you've got your hose, and then we've actually put a silicone boot on the end. So again, depending on um, what you're trying to accomplish, we can actually change the, um, the insulation to fit your needs. Again, different end connections. So typically with a crimped end connection that you're talking about here, you're gonna see that on our PFA Teflon lined hoses uh, for a swage end connection. See this typically more on our um, thermal plastic hoses. Uh, welded ends, you're gonna use that on your all metal hoses. And then for push on end connections, that will be for our rubber hoses. So Phil, do we have any questions so far on construction and selection? Yes, we do, Corey. <clears throat> There's a question around uh, uh, certification of CRN to our product. So I just want to back up a little bit and, and a CRN identifies um, that that design for a specific product has been accepted by the governing body in, in the province. So in Ontario, the governing body is TSSA, the Technical Standards and Safety Authority. Uh, in Alberta, that would be ABSA. Um, so what that does is that ensures that in general, any product going into a pressurized system above 15 PSI requires or in general will require a Canadian registration number. And that involves witness proof testing, technical uh, information. Uh, then we would be published, we would be given a statutory declaration and a C of C, a certificate of compliance for that product after witness proof testing and, and extensive testing. So uh, by no stretch is it inexpensive to achieve Canadian registration numbers, but uh, not all products have Canadian registration numbers. And so uh, a CRN is required when a system is registered with the governing body for pressure vessels, boilers, um, and uh, it is in the province of Ontario in general required above 15 PSI uh, pretty much any province in Canada. Uh, hopefully that answers your question and, and that's it for now, Corey. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Phil. Okay, so now we're going to get into some best practices. We're going to talk about some hose storage. We're going to talk about bend radius, hose routing and why that's important. And then we're going to talk about the acronym STAMPED. So when you're basically, whether you buy a brand new hose or say you're a, uh, like at a pharmaceutical plant where you're basically, you might run uh, your application and then you disconnect your hose and you got to clean everything out. We want to make sure that you're storing it as clean and dry conditions and you want it to be protected as well uh, so that it's not uh, being exposed to uh, the sunlight and or just UV light in general. We want to avoid maybe putting caps on the or put caps on the end so that you avoid uh, cross contamination and things like that. And we should always look at the sh shelf life of the hose and, and, and basically inspect the hose just before you're using it as well almost every time. So again here, I like the way they've used a long, uh, longer hose and they've actually stored it over a nice bend radius here so that we're not going to cause any uh, kinking. I do go into plants all the time and I'll see maybe there's a nail on the wall and somebody's put a hose over it. And then the hose puts a lot of pressure on that one wear point where the, the hose is resting on it. Even here, you're actually putting the weight and everything on the actual outside of the hose on the cover. And so if, the, if this little uh, shelf part here, like the knife part, if that's actually too thin, you might actually cause the hose to kink there. So I like hanging it by the end connections, as you'll see right here. Um, that's nice way to, to store hoses. 
Again, showing uh, another one where they're storing it again. Uh, and again, here you'll see how they're storing it by the end connections as well. Why is ho hose routing in considerations? Why is it important to consider how you're gonna run your hose? Well, hoses are typically one of the last things that are selected. Usually it's a, oh, I need a hose. I've got a piece of equipment I gotta hook up. What I like to carry around is I like to carry either a medium piece of rope or even um, um, some rubber hose and usually about 10 feet in length. And what I'll do is I'll actually start at one end connection and then I can run it over to where we wanna go for a customer. But the nice part is then I can mark where we ended up and then I can lay it straight and I can get a good measurement so that when we're, when we're thinking about our hose, we wanna know the distance that you're gonna be as well. So again, to determine the overall length, it'll be a, a you know 120 inches. So if you want a 10 foot hose, so you have to do it all in inches. Uh, you can do it all in uh, millimeters as well if that's desired. Um, but again, when we're selecting a hose, it's the overall length that we want to we want, not the um, the live length. Uh, again, another thing that you want to consider is again incorrect, correct. But if we're pulling a hose too tight, what we can do is we can actually cause stress on the end connections, maybe even cause it to pull away from the the, the core tube and the cover, the braid package. Uh, again, when we're the other thing we got to consider is their temperature cycling. So again, you always wanna have a little bit of movement in your hose. Uh, and again, here we're, we've got that little bit of movement and we've got our end connections that are, we don't have to worry about. Again, so if it's temperature cycling, moving in and out, we don't have to worry about that and cause any premature wear. Again, say we have motion. A lot of people use hoses where we have motion, but if you take a look here, because the hose is so short, when we actually go to move this hose, we could be causing premature failure right here on that end connection. If we make it a little bit longer, we actually have a lot more fluid flow and we don't end up having that uh, stress on the end connections. Can one plane radius, if we're taking a look at this hose right here, you'll see it's, it's fixed at one point and then you'll notice that as we get over here, it's gonna move back and forth. So this is actually a, what they call a double plane and we wanna to try to avoid that with hoses. Over here, you'll see, we could actually take that hose out and we could actually put a piece of tubing in there and eliminate that because it's actually at a fixed point and that would cost you a lot less money. Then the other part is you've got a nice U-shaped bend and that allows your hose to have increased cycle life. Again, we got to talk about minimum bend radius. I always like to use the analogy when we're bending tubing, we have to have a minimum so that we can bottom it out. Well, the same thing here, when you're looking at your hose, you don't wanna see the hose flex right after the end connection, okay? We don't wanna see that, we wanna have it go within its nice bend radius. Again, when you start to flex a hose right out of the end connection, you could cause premature wear and it could start to kink right at the end connection as well. So here you'll see, this is actually in a pharmaceutical facility. And what happens is they have it connected to a piece of equipment, but then as soon as they uh, are done with that piece of equipment, they unconnect the hose and they just let it hang there. And you'll see there that we're causing a lot of stress right here on that end connection, okay? A simple thing that we've uh, suggested to this customer is, you know what, let's add an integral elbow onto the end of that hose. That th therefore, it's kind of like the hose on the outside of your house. It, the hose always points down. It never points straight out. So we want to avoid having hoses come straight out. Now here you'll see we've the, the actual cover or the braid package, I'm not sure what it is by, just by looking at the hose, but it's actually pulling away from the hose. So maybe we've um, made the working pressure less, you know, maybe we've caused some, we could get some uh, failures here, but then just to keep that in mind, if you start to see that, that's a lot of wear and a lot of weight on that end connection. So it's pulling the cover away. Again, minimum bend radius. You'll see here again, we talk about having a nice swooping uh, U-shape uh, versus trying to pull it too tight. So this hose here was selected and it was just too short a hose to fit in that application. So again, talking about our routing and make sure that we don't kink the hose. What happens when a, a, a Teflon line hose kinks is the bore, actually the core tube starts to flatten out because we've gone beyond its bend radius. 
And then what happens is the stainless steel braid package actually pushes into where that um, area was left and it's, it causes the host to kink. Now, when we look here, are we gonna have the same working pressure? I'm not sure, I can't see inside the hose. Uh, typically what we do here is tell them to maybe get another hose or, or you know, and look at, is it the right hose for the right application? So again, hose strain. You'll see here, we added an elbow and therefore our hose can be nice, okay? Where here, you'll see that we can cause a little bit, that weight of that hose right here can cause strain on that end connection and cause it to pull away from that end connection or possibly kink just by the, depending on the size of the hose and the weight of the hose. So again, stamp. So if you're working with anybody who's in the hose industry, this acronym is used quite a bit. Um, the, what you're looking at here is what's the size of the hose that you're looking for? What's the temperature range that you're gonna be using this on? What application? Are you going to be using running steam? Or are you going to be running a polymer? Again, the, what, the, what is the media that you're going to be running? And again, what pressure are we going to be running? Are you going to be 6,000 PSI? Or are you going to be 100 PSI? And then what end connections do we want? Do we want flanges? Do we want sanitary end connections? And then how quick do you need it? And how many do you need? So again, here we're talking about just some of the things that we see out in the industry. Um, but here you'll see we've got uh, a kinked and flattened hose, okay? We've got some um, where the actual cover is being blistered or uh, being cut out. Here you'll see one where we've got a nice deep cut in the hose as well. This may not be important to somebody, but in the event that say, uh, for example, here in Ontario, we have varying conditions of weather. Uh, you know, even in May, I think we've gone from uh, almost just about zero to 34 degrees uh, within a two week span. Uh, you know, if the moisture gets in here uh, or did something get cut and affect the braid package without actually looking at the hose, we don't know if there's anything wrong. And here you'll see we've got a nice blister. So this is that core tube. Um, it's permeating and causing the actual cover to blister. So again, have we affected the pressure rating of that hose? Again, here you'll see excessive uh, cover damage to this hose. Again, this is the braid package that allows it to uh, have that pressure uh, containment. So have we affected the pressure rating of that hose? Most likely we have. Here you'll notice, I don't know if this hose is the, if the cover is the braid package. So again, if you see excessive damage on your hoses, you may want to evaluate them and make sure that they're, um, that they're not gonna cause any issues for you down the road. In this slide here, what you'll see here, we've got some cracking and embrittlement. Uh, maybe it was exposed outside, got uh, maybe a chemical on it that it's not inert to, okay? Over here, you see that we've got some um, wear and tear where this has been cut and the, braid, uh, the cover's been pulled away. And you'll see here on this thermoplastic hose, you'll actually see the core tube is now exposed. So have, have we affected the pressure rating of that hose? Most likely we have, so we want to keep that into consideration when we're looking at our hoses. Again, you'll see here, I, I can't see if there's a braid package underneath. So that's something when we see this, we'll say to our customers, you know, you may want to have this hose pressure tested or inspected. Uh, and most likely with these, we, got, we put in a, a recommendation to replace. Here you can see where the hose has been kind of flattened. Uh, so it's probably in an area where it's rubbing or being moved. Uh, and it's rubbing against either a metal or another hose. Uh, and our favorite thing here, duct tape. I use quite a bit of duct tape and you'll see this customer here use duct tape on their hose as well to help contain the pressure. And here you'll see the covers being pulled away from this hose right here. Okay. Vacuum. So that we always get asked, can you use this hose in vacuum? The answer is, is usually yes with a, a lot of our hoses. But what you got to consider is if the hose doesn't have a vacuum rating, definitely ask somebody if it can be used. Because what happens is whether you're using a roughing pump or you're using a high vacuum uh, pump as well, you can actually, the core tube can pull away from the braid package and, and come in and cause it to kink internally. So you may not see it on the outside of the hose, but on the inside of the hose. Where we see this happen quite a bit is in steam applications. So you have, because steam will expand uh, 1600 times, but it'll also collapse 1600 times. So if you have steam in a line, then you shut down the system and you just let it go without draining out that hose. 
what can happen is that hose will go from a vapor to a to a liquid and it'll collapse 1600 times and that'll pull that hose right in we've seen that quite a bit in steam applications again with our weather that we have you can get embrittlement on the outside of your covers so always keep in mind where we're going to put this hose and the environment that's going to be in uh, and again end connection damage how do you treat your hose and again this really goes to how long your hose will last do you take your hose out and do you store it neatly do you take your hose out throw it on the workbench do you throw it did, did a forklift drive, drive over it again these are just things that we see out in the industry again bad practice if you're going to use a cushion or a hose clamp make sure you get the right size for the hose um, a lot of places uh, that we go into you're not allowed to use hose clamps um, and you're not out allowed to manufacture your own hose. So this is, again, not a good practice uh, in the industry, just to keep that in mind. And again, hose consider consideration checklist. Who do I contact about hoses? Um, what are my risks when selecting a hose? Where should hoses be utilized? Most times you don't need a hose. A lot of times you can run pipe or tubing, whatever you want to run. Um, but hoses are usually, as I said, selected as the last minute thing. They've never, they weren't necessarily planned, uh, but they're like, uh oh, I got to get over there. So I need a hose. So again, not always do you need a hose. So when should I use one hose versus the other? You know, do I need an all metal hose? Do I need a, a Teflon line hose? Do I need just a regular air hose? And how often should I replace the hose? Again, that answer, we've kind of talked about it a bit, is how you use it. Is it in a high critical application where, you know what, once a year you want to replace that hose because if it does fail, it's taking your equipment down and downtime's, you know, costing you a lot more than a simple hose. And why should I select a hose over tubing? Again, not always is a hose required. It's a lot uh, more cost effective to install a little piece of tubing, you know, versus say a quarter inch piece of tubing at 225 a foot or whatever, you know, versus, maybe $60 for a hose. So again, sometimes it's not always, do you need a hose? It might just be, do I want a hose? Again, do we have any uh, questions, Phil, with uh, best practices? Yeah, we sure do, sure do Corey, thank you. Um, <clears throat> first question was uh, with respect to bend radius. And in our literature, there's always a static and a dynamic bend radius uh, published. There's also information, as Corey was showing you, how to do calculations uh, for a hose length in order to get the right amount of uh, bend radius in a hose. So that is published on our website in published literature around hose, and uh, it's readily available. And you can reach out and call one of our technical support people anytime, and, and we can help you with that as well. Uh, the second question came in is around, uh, uh, do we provide coatings for chemical inert? Uh, well, Teflon by nature is inert to virtually all known things to man other than about four chemicals. Uh, if that runs into a temperature pressure situation where the inertness of Teflon is, uh, you require something else, um, there are coatings that are available like Swayco, those types of things, uh, yet very rarely would we lean to those? Typically a Teflon coating is, is used or a Teflon core tube, uh, depending on the application. So reach out to us with the specifics on the uh, uh, chemical that you're using and one of our tech team or tech team at one of your sales and service centers can certainly help you with um, understanding the chemical inertness of the uh, core tube. And that's it for now, Corey. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much, Phil. So again, here's my email. If you do have any questions as well, um, feel free to reach out. Again, this is our local technical support team. Um, but as Tim mentioned earlier, uh, we are worldwide. And so definitely reach out to your local Swage Lock uh, to get uh, engineering and technical support. Um, but this is our team. And I just want to say thank you very much for your time today. If there's any other questions, please feel free to ask. We'll hang around here for a little bit. Hi, Corey. Yes, we had another question come in. Um, the question was around using a hose versus tubing. 
it all becomes your setup alignment. Is there vibration? Um, you know, there can be benefits of using a hose in, in certain applications over tubing, and yet there can be some real benefits of using tubing over hose. So uh, again, reach out to one of our technical support people. We will be happy to work with you on specifics. Uh, you know, it's often good to know the whole system uh, integrity and, and components and what's really trying to be achieved. So um, hoses have advantages in certain cases and disadvantages in others. So it's all very much uh, site and application specific. And again, goes back to what type of hose you might use in that application. And that uh, appears to be all the questions for now. We'll hang here for a few more minutes. If there's any more questions, we'll be happy to answer. And uh, over to you, Tim. Thanks, Phil. As uh, Phil just mentioned, uh, we'll we'll hang here. Um, we'll keep the Q and A open for a few minutes after the after the meeting today. If there are any more questions that come in, uh, but you do have the email as well for Corey for uh, Phil Reed, and our whole technical team is available if you have further questions regarding hose or any other applications you're working on. I uh, wanted to thank everybody for attending today, and we. Uh, we look forward to talking to you more during our uh, tech talks we have lined up coming in the in the coming weeks so thanks very much and we'll talk soon